before, and you'll pardon me, I'm coming off a, a pretty nasty head cold that hit me full force Thursday and Friday, so uh, my voice sounds a little more deep this morning. It's artificial. It's a sickness. Uh, it's good to see every one of you here this morning, and then as if you're a guest, so glad that you could join us, and uh, as it's been said, we're going to have a fun uh, after the service dinner, where we're just going to uh, have a really good time. Uh, the way it's going to work is after we conclude the service, uh, there's going to be about 15 minutes to get things prepped up, and uh, you can make your way to a table. Uh, those of you who know each other, I want to encourage you, like especially if you're in the same small group, make an effort not to sit with people you know. And uh, let's use this as a time to get to know people, because it's not easy to get to know people in this day and age. And you kind of have to make a concerted effort to, to make that happen. That this is one of the reasons why we're doing the dinner, as well as an opportunity to invite people from our community to come and enjoy a meal with us and uh, for us to meet needs. Uh, so uh, if you can do that. Also, kids, so it's good to have you in the service. Uh, during the meal, I'm going to ask that you not run around. Uh, there's not going to be much room for that. I was a kid who grew up in church, and I ran around, I climbed under these seats, I knew every hiding place in the building, but there are times where it's just not a good time to run around, and this will be one of those days. So uh, stay with your mom or your dad or your guardian, and that will help us out a great deal. So when you sit at the table, we have some icebreaker uh, sheets there to get the conversation going, make it easy, then we'll dismiss tables, um, kind of like at a wedding or that sort of a place, Then we'll just have a great time enjoying... Uh, an Italian meal this morning, and then afterwards we'll do a little bingo scavenger hunt, give away some movie tickets, and like I said, just the whole idea is just to have a lot of fun. My joke around our house is, casers don't have fun. <laughs> so we're breaking a rule this morning. <laughs> All right, so kids, uh, you should have gotten a listening sheet. If you didn't, there are listening sheets that our usher can give you. Uh, two extra words to put on your listening sheet, and one is the word will, because I'm going to talk about understanding God's will. And the other word is mysterious, and sometimes those go together. All right, so um, I think every day people ask uh, a question, uh, why am I here? Why am I here? What on earth am I, am I here for? Or um, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? Or how can uh, I find out what I'm supposed to be doing so I don't end up wasting my life? Because I don't think anybody wants to do that. But the, and the Bible says, understand what God wants you to do. And so today, I'm going to do my very best to share from God's word how you can understand God's will for your life. So I want to invite you to stand with me as I read five verses from the book of Ephesians. This is a book that we've been working our way through, and uh, this is a very helpful portion. Ephesians 5, verse 15, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but act like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, and make music to the Lord. Where? In your hearts. Before it comes out of your mouth, it's in your heart. And give thanks for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, when my kids were smaller, uh, we used to play hide-and-seek. We don't do that much anymore. How many of you used to play hide-and-seek or still play hide-and-seek? Yeah, a lot of fun. Well, when one of my kids who was uh, smaller, used to hide, and I would enter the room to seek that person. I'm trying to be gender neutral right now. I'd walk in the room looking for the person I was seeking, and all of a sudden I'd hear a, hachoo, hachoo. And I'd look over, and by the, there behind the curtains, I could see a, two little feet sticking out from underneath the curtains, and there was this cute little bump 
in the curtain, about the right height as that child. And it was obvious that this little one wanted to be found. And when it comes to understanding God's will, I just think that's a perfect story because God's like that. He's going, hachu, hachu. A little bit louder, though, and probably more authoritative. God wants to be found. He's not playing games with us. He gets real clear how to understand his will. And so my goal for you this morning is to share what I believe will help you take the next step. I don't know how you make big decisions in your life. I'm guessing that many of you, you're in the midst of trying to make a big decision. And my hope is that this will help you in that. The first thing I want to talk about is kind of some preliminary stuff about what not to do before we get into what the scriptures say what to do. And the first thing you don't want to do is uh, we need to understand that God's will is not a feeling. And if you want to follow on the back of the program, um, that's the first fill in. God's will is not a feeling. What I mean by that is that sometimes people make God's will to be this mysterious, mystical thing. And uh, it's almost like it's based on emotion. And uh, God's will is not based on emotional sensation. It's built on practical instruction. The Bible does say in Colossians that we are to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. And that's the language of an official's whistle, you know, saying, okay, you're out of bounds or you're in bounds. But the peace of Christ is not a feeling as much as it is peace of mind. And so sometimes people are like, oh, they're just like waiting for this right feeling to know it's God's will. Well, feelings are pretty fickle. Wouldn't you agree with me? And, I mean, I've had some feelings where I'm not sure if it's the, it's the great Mexican food I had the night before or the pizza or something like that. So, you know, it's just, it's just not a good sound foundation to base your big decisions on by going with, with a feeling. God's will is also not about a formula. And though uh, God gives practical instructions, I'm going to give you some here in a minute, uh, you, you can't take God and just manipulate him down to a formula. Because now you're getting into, like, incantations or a spell. Like, I'm going to follow this formula, and I'm going to whip up God's will. Well, God cannot be manipulated. He is the Lord God of all. And it, he is not that way. Life just doesn't work that way. And so we're going to move past feelings. We're not going to um, create these formulas. So what do we need when we're trying to understand God's will? The first thing is that we need to understand that finding God's will begins with a relationship, a friendship with God. God wants you to get to know him because he already knows you. The Bible says that God is your creator, and your heavenly Father created you. And once this relationship with God is established, then things will begin to fall into place. So in verse 16, it says, Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Does it surprise you that we live in evil days? Does anybody need to be convinced that there is not, that you're convinced there's not evil in this world? Uh, I didn't think so, so I'll skip that part. Uh, the evil that happens in this world, not everything that happens is God's will. And this is really an important distinction. The Bible says we do live in evil days, but God is not the author of evil. God has made human beings with the ability to choose. That's what separates us from the animals. We have the ability to choose good. We have the ability to make bad choices. And we have the ability to make evil choices. And it is a dangerous thing to say that God is responsible for the evil choices that someone makes. So while there is evil in this world, thankfully, we are not powerless because the Bible says that even in these evil days, there are, there's opportunity. And in that opportunity, we can make good choices. And we can make good choices together with other like-minded people who want to do good in these evil days. And God gives and provides opportunity to do just that. Many of the ministries and the small groups, and you guys are making good choices. And you seek to get outside the walls into our community 
and do good, to pray for people, to provide food through the refuge and other things like that. Well, verse 17 says, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what God wants you to do. So the word thought is in that verse, and understanding, obviously God's referring to our minds. God wants us to use our brains. He put that thing between your ears for a reason, and he wants you to use it, and he wants me to use it. So um, we're not going to fully understand God's will with our minds, but God can reveal himself and reveal his heart to us so that with our minds we can figure out what would please God and what would be according to his will. Now, I want to say first and foremost that Isaiah 45 verse 15 says that truly, O God of Israel, our Savior, you work in mysterious ways. You ever heard that phrase, God works in mysterious ways? Some of you are nodding your head going, oh man, I know for sure that God works in mysterious ways. And you have a story when you say that. You're like, oh, I was, I thought, I tried to seek God's will, and this is how I was doing it, and then it didn't work out, but then I, I kind of gave it all to God, and it's okay, you got to be in control of this thing, and then something began to unfold, and it was just like, I could have never planned it that way. God worked in mysterious ways, and we have to, you know, be surrendered to that. But when it comes to God's will, uh, there, are three, there are three types of will that I want to talk about. Uh, first of all, there's God's perfect will. When God's perfect will is done, I think it's kind of obvious that God's will is done. God has a perfect will for you. God has a perfect will for me. He has a perfect will for our church. He has a perfect will for your family or for your friends and, and for your school and things like that. And when we respond in obedience to God's perfect will, that means everybody's on plan A. And that's a good thing. I mean, that's when things are humming right and going the way it should but here's the problem. Paul even said in, in, in Romans, I want to do God, God's will, but I find myself not doing God's will. And so this is where God's mercy and God's grace comes in the bear, is that there's also God's permissive will. And that is when in our weakness, we respond to God's perfect will uh, in an inappropriate way. We respond imperfectly. Then God, in his foreknowledge, before time, he knew we were going to make that bad choice. And so he developed an alternative plan if we come clean to him and say, okay, I blew it. Help me to make something out of this wreckage, then that can happen. And so God has a permissive will. It was not his perfect will, but God can still bring good out of it, and he can bring blessing even in our weakness. That's his permissive will. And then there's his preventative will, and that's where God says no, or this is where God says wait, because he's working behind the scenes. It's like he's saying, no, I have something better. And I can tell you, I mean, there have been times in my life where I prayed, oh, God, I want this to happen. I, I want this job. Or, oh, God, I remember <clears throat> I was dating somebody, and I thought, oh, God, this is the one. And, uh, boy, now that I look back, neither one of us were, were ready for that. And God said, no. And I was mad and I was sad and all that kind of stuff. But now I'm like really glad because it wasn't Tammy at that time. And I would have been a horrible husband at that time. And so God blessed. He prevented me from doing something foolish by saying no. So sometimes there's God's preventative will. But here's the deal. And this is where we got to get comfortable with God. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 says this. The secret things belong to our Lord to our God. There are some things that are in the heart of God that we just will not know. And we got to be cool with that. That's just walking by faith. And, uh, you know, even Jesus, when he was here on earth, there are some things he didn't know. Like someone asked him, hey, you know, when he's talking about the end times, when time is going to end, when's it going to happen? And Jesus said, I don't know. That's the Father's call. And he wasn't like, I can't tell you. He didn't tell me. I'm like, he was like brooding about it. He just, he was cool with it. Father knows. If he knows it, I'm good with it. And then someone also asked him one time, hey, can, you know, can we sit at your right hand in heaven one day? And Jesus said, hey, that's not my call. That's my father's call. So there are things that the father knew that he was fine with. 
And so, you know, if, if Jesus had to live with mystery, and if secret things belonged to God the Father, and he was down on it, he was good with it, I mean, then so should we. So what do you do, though, when you are dealing with mysterious stuff? You know, like, when you, what do you do when, when God's will is mysterious and there's no clear answers? Um, well, the biggest thing is you got to just focus on what's in front of you. I mean, we get so far ahead of ourselves. We're thinking like 10 moves down the line. But life doesn't work that way, right? I mean, anybody ever, is anybody still trying to make 10-year plans or 20-year plans? Because, I mean, life just doesn't work that way. And so the biggest thing to do is, okay, what's in front of me right now? And so you just keep trusting God. You know that, okay, things are mysterious. Things are not clear. He's making me wait in this situation. All right, he's, he's developing my character. And that's why I'm going to take me, with me to heaven. He's growing my faith. I have to trust him even though I don't have all the answers. I have to believe that he is working all things together for good because I have been called according to his good purposes. But here are some questions that can help maybe bring some clarity if you're in the midst of making a big decision right now. First question you can ask is, is, is it wrong? Is it wrong? This thing I'm thinking about doing, is it wrong? Uh, that's where we have the Bible. The Bible is God's revealed truth of matters of belief and conduct. The Bible reveals who God is. It tells God's story as he works his story through, throughout time and history with humanity. But he also gets very clear about this is right and this is wrong. And so if the Bible says explicitly it's wrong, you don't even have to pray about it except, God, help me to do what's right. And so the Bible will help us to know what's wrong. And sometimes it may not explicitly say this is wrong, but you can tell by the spirit of Scripture about this matter what, what is right and what is wrong. For example, let me give you an example for that. The Bible says that, that God is not the author of fear. He has not given us a spirit of fear. Instead, he has given us a spirit of love and of power and self-discipline. And so if you're making a decision and you're making this decision because you're afraid to trust God right now, or you're, you're running from responsibility that you're responsible for, you're not in God's will. Because God is not the author of fear. He doesn't lead us while we're fearful. He leads us as we're trusting. Another good question to ask is, okay, if it's not explicitly wrong in the Bible, is it wise? Is it a wise thing to do? Now all things are helpful in our lives. For example, it says to redeem the time in these evil days or make the most of every opportunity. So let's talk about your time for a second here. And let's talk about wisdom and your time. The reality is that we all get the same amount of time. We all get 168 hours a week. And our time equals our life. What we do with our time is our life. And so every stage of life Wisdom would dictate, you can't do everything. And so wisdom would say, in this stage of your life, you can only do a few things really, really well. Wisdom would tell you, make sure these things that you do really, really well will get the greatest reward, especially eternally. And so wisdom would dictate with your time, all right, what stage of life are you right now? What is the most important things? What's best and what's good. And there's a lot of good things that we can be a part of with our time. But the best things are for you in the stage. And if you can identify just three, if you, if before your head hits the pillow tonight, if you can identify three things that I know for sure these are like the most important things that I should be zeroing in on like all the time. And you can rank order them. Number one, number two, number three. That's, that's worth a trip to hear this message today, just kind of giving you that clarity. And then wisdom will also say, what are the distractions, what are the time wasters that are keeping you from what's best? Because not everything is wrong, it's just a lot of things aren't, just aren't flat out helpful right now in this stage of your life. The third question is, what would Jesus do? Would Jesus do it? God's most important goal for your life is to know Jesus. That's number one, every stage. That should be number one. As you get to know Jesus, you will find yourself wanting to do what would please him. 
And the Bible says that, that Jesus is the, perf- is the personification of righteousness and of wisdom. And the more you experience the love of God through Christ, the more you just can't bear the thought of, of hurting him and, and disappointing him. And so God's not going to play hide-and-seek with you when it comes to his will. I mean, time is too precious. Your life is too important. His plans and his purposes are too important. He wants you to understand his will. He wants you to live it. But we also have human weaknesses, and we need his help. Um, I left my mask at home. My hockey mask. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, uh, there's a story that's told of a man who wasn't very bright. He was not from Indiana. He was from one of the bordering states. <laughs> and he, he bought this chainsaw, and he, and he took it back to where he bought it, and he told the guy, hey, this chainsaw doesn't work. And he goes, really? He goes, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty sharp and everything, but it doesn't cut worth a, dime, worth a hoot. And the guy goes, really? Okay. And so he grabbed this pull thing, and he pulled it and fired it up, and the guy who bought it, who brought it back, goes, what's that noise? <laughs> For those who didn't get the joke, he was trying to use a chainsaw without the motor. Well, in some ways, you know, a lot of you and I, we're sharp. We're sharp people. But if we don't have the motor, if we don't have the fuel to help us do what we were designed to do, we're not going to make very good progress. And so that's why in verse 18 it says that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Wine should not dominate a believer's life. The Holy Spirit should dominate our life. Our minds should be under the influence of God. And so God uses wine as an example to describe the work of the Spirit in a believer's life. So how does this work? If I want to be filled with the Spirit, how does it work? Well, Tony Evans explains it just wonderfully. He says when somebody's drunk, uh, they can't walk normally like they normally walk when they're drunk. Why? Because they're under the influence. Something else is controlling their motor abilities. If someone is normally a quiet person and they they get drunk, then they they might become loud and bold. Why? Because something else is controlling their personality. If someone can't sing and they get drunk, they might start singing and thinking like they just won first place in American Idol. But something is controlling their perspective. The point Paul is making is that when someone gets drunk, they act outside of themselves. Something else has taken over. And what Paul's getting at is that we need to become spiritually intoxicated by living under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And when God's Spirit resides in us, it's going to affect our walk. It's going to affect our talk. It's going to affect our whole outlook on life. And so someone who uh, gets to know Christ and is filled with the Spirit, many times God will lead them to begin doing things that they never would have ever thought about doing. I mean, if you knew who I was in elementary school, middle school, and you told me one day that I'd be standing in front of all kinds of people all the time talking about God and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in front of people, public speaking, I would have said, no stinking way. No way. But then God works in mysterious ways, doesn't he? And some people who are shy, as God grows in their life, something begins to take over And he, in that weakness, begins to provide a strength. And they begin to do great things on his behalf. Paul says that when you become filled with the Spirit, for sure two things are going to happen in your life. And this is how you'll know it's happening. He says, first of all, you're going to become become more worshipful. And you're going to become more thankful. Would you say we live in a thankful society? So he says uh, in verses 19 and 20 that you're just going to kind of have a song in your heart. And what, what, what ha- comes out of our mouth is what's in our heart. And when we are just so grateful for God, we're going to begin worshiping, and it's not even Sunday. And 
we're going to find ourselves giving thanks, and it's not even Thanksgiving Day. And so everyone else around us, they're complaining, and, and they're, they're just, you know, down on the way the presidential race is going, or where the country is going, or the economy is going, or whatever it is that people are talking about around you. You can still be joyful and happy, because your focus is on the throne of God. You're worshiping Him. You're aware of all that He is doing and has done in your life and what He's doing in the church and what He's doing in the world. And you just, there's just so much to be thankful for because the Spirit helps us to see things that normally we would not see. So how do you receive the Spirit? How do you receive the Spirit? Well, the first thing that God wants you to do is, is to get to know Him by uh, receiving His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the Bible says in Romans 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What that basically is saying is that God sent Jesus Christ the bridge, the gap of our separation between God and ourselves. That gap or that separation was caused by us excluding God, keeping him out of our lives, or just actively fighting God. And the Bible says we've all done this. The Bible says we've all sinned and we've fallen short of God's holy ways. And the sad thing about the separation between myself and God or between you and God in this state is that when you're not connected with God, you're not connected with life. God is the giver of life. And he wants to give you eternal life. What that means is he wants to give you life right now. He wants to give you life tomorrow and the next day and the next day, all the way till, till the day they put you six feet under, and then all of eternity beyond. And it just multiplies from there. The Bible says that Jesus Christ died for our sins, and he rose from the dead so that you can receive eternal life, and you could be adopted into his spiritual family. And this joy-filled life can be yours. And I just love that I get the privilege to share this whenever I can, is that God can give you life. All you have to do is just place your trust in Jesus Christ to ask, you to for, ask him to forgive you of your sin and ask him to lead your life, to take over th through the Holy Spirit. And so, the, you know, the question of the day was, okay, how can we understand God's will? Well, it just begins by saying, Lord, I want you to take over my life. I want you to lead my life. I want your will to be my will. I'm surrendering my life to you. And it's just a simple prayer. And what I'm going to do is I want to pray for a couple situations. One is if you're here this morning and you've got a big decision you need to make and you need some clarity... I want to pray for you. Also, if you would like to receive Christ, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. It's called the sinner's prayer, which is basically anybody who receives Christ and has to admit they're a sinner. And it's the prayer that a sinner prays to a holy God who's offering a full pardon and a full life through Christ. And so with everyone, if you just close your eyes, and I just want to pray for that. First of all, if you'd like to receive Christ, just uh, in your heart, pray this prayer with me. Dear God, I have come to the place where I realize that I can't do it on my own. I need you. As much as I understand, I would like you to come into my life. I'd like you to forgive me of my sins. And I recognize the cross was where my sins were paid for and forgiven. Lord Jesus, I want you to take over. And I, I'm sorry, but I got, a, I got a big mess. I'm giving you my mess. I'm giving you everything. If you would take me, I would be honored for you to come to me, and I receive you. So please, come into my life. Amen. And Lord, I also want to pray for uh, folks who have a big decision to make. Lord, I pray that uh, they would make you their focal point. I pray that uh, you would help us not to allow ourselves to be distracted by things that um, aren't you. So I pray that the number one spot in our lives for everyone, including myself, 
is that uh, you would be the number one place. Lord, may you become more real to us. May we get to know you better. As we get to know you better, as we pray, as we read your word, as we talk to godly people for advice and counsel and wisdom, just pray, Lord, you just make it clear. And for the person, they have to make a decision, and, a, and both choices are good choices, and they're not bad choices in your eyes. Just help them to make the choice. Just pull the trigger and, and move forward. Thank you, Lord. There's always your permissive will. And so I pray you just take the edge off of their emotions. Um, some people, they got to make this decision, and they wake up in the morning, and they got a knot in their stomach. They just, it just won't escape them. Lord, I pray that you untie that knot. And I pray that you give them peace that transcends all understanding. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Well, as we uh, respond.